One thing we talked about before we started the interview was I asked you about enlightenment, whether that was kind of something you were aiming for, a human level. And I think one of you said that you don't worry, too, I think it's you, Caroline, you don't worry too much about it because enlightenment takes care of itself. That's I right. I thought that was an interesting statement, if you could maybe explain that a little bit more. Yes, I mean, this, this is very much a, a Pure Land point of view because Pure Land Buddhism, I think, takes much more of a sense of the human as being an ordinary person. You know, in a way, it's, it's what we say colloquially, we're just human. And in Pure Land, that, that's very much how it's seen, that we're human beings, we make mistakes, we get things wrong and so on. And that's just in the nature of how we are. And we are in relationship to Buddha, and Buddha is enlightened and all loving and all compassionate and so on, and we are in relation to Buddha. So the whole business of enlightenment becomes something that comes out of that relationship. And it's something which comes to us much more through a process of grace rather than through a process of our own efforts and, and attainment. And, you know, what I've found is that through taking on the a more pure and aspect to practice, it's been immensely freeing because I'm no longer sort of thinking, well, I have to do this in order to... You know, it's quite interesting when, when we were talking about our sort of history with Buddhism. I, I think I came into Buddhism in many ways with a sort of self-power attitude of, oh, this is a great relief, I can just get on and do it, and I don't have to worry about believing in anything. But actually what I discovered through it was that I can't do it myself. It's not something that I'm going to achieve by spending hours and hours and hours sitting in meditation or putting myself through ascetic practices or, or something of that kind. I'm just not going to sort of polish myself to that degree. But yet, somehow, if I can just let go and trust, there is something extremely trustworthy in the universe. And, and I suppose my sense is that, at bottom, the spiritual nature of the universe is not something that judges us and not something that we need to placate in some way through, through effort, but something that's just available and all we need to do is just to be open to it. And so enlightenment's not something I worry about. Enlightenment's something that's, that's there. It's, it's something that will come in its own time. I think my, my job is not to pursue enlightenment for myself. My job is to help to generate the conditions which enable other people to be more loving. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, this grace, I remember an interview we did last week, uh, my wife Renata did with Pamela Wilson, who's one of these people in non-duality, in the non-duality world, and she mentioned grace a lot. And it is somehow a dichotomy almost of like there's, on the one hand, it does seem most people that have a quantum leap in realisation, enlightenment, whatever we call it, it does happen at the grace of God. On the other hand, if you're unhappy in your life and it isn't working, it's unintelligent just to keep doing what you're doing, just hoping one day something happens that changes. You feel, well, I might as well make a contribution. And, yeah. and, and, I, and yeah. I think that what you're saying, David, is that your contribution is to, in a way, these are not your words, but somehow help make the world a better place. And through that, something else may happen it's on a personal the, basis, but yes. you don't know. Well, and it, it's just the example of Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha uh, was disturbed by what's called the four sights of old age, sickness and death and so on. Set out on a spiritual quest, devoted himself very wholeheartedly and diligently to ascetic practices and, and things that were very challenging and difficult in his search for his own enlightenment. But, his in, but what we call his enlightenment was when he gave all that up. And from then on, his whole life was devoted to concern for others, concern for what their needs were, what their position was. And, and when you see him in that ascetic period, he's becoming more and more isolated until eventually he's really down and out. And afterwards, you see him more and more involved with other people, generating a sangha, a movement, uh, that has had a huge impact on the world ever since. So I think that turnaround that occurred for him is a very important example. Does, does Pure Land Buddhism itself, do you feel there's a process where it evolves, the, 
the teaching evolves, oh, the process yes, evolves. Yes, everything evolves and changes. Uh, and I would certainly want it that way. Uh, we try to be creative and there's a lot of discussion and debate and uh, argument and, and so on in our community. You know, I don't mean in a nasty way. I mean, it, it's, it's like uh, diversity is valued and, and mm. we're a very um, discursive, aren't we, community. Mm. Yes. There's, there's a lot of discussion and reasoning and exploration and, and creativity. I mean, people are quite, in the, in the arts, people in the community are quite, a number mm -hmm. of people in the community are quite uh, involved in mm -hmm. the arts one way or another, as well, well as in intellectual pursuits and also in political and economic uh, things. Of and one and I think in terms of Pure Land that... I mean, we're, we're Westerners, we're practicing yeah, Pure Land, as you right. said at the beginning, it's a Japanese form of Buddhism. Yes. Um, although actually, I mean, Pure Land is a strand that goes through the whole of Buddhism and you find Pure Land strands in Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, yeah. and even Theravada has quite a Pure Land feel in, in some ways in which it's practiced. So, but it's particularly in Japanese Buddhism, it, it is defined into schools, and it's from there that we, we take our form. But bring it to the West, we're having to look at it and go back to the sort of basics and say, well, what's, what are the roots of this and what's, what's the feel of it and what's it actually trying to do and mm. how do we express this in a Western paradigm? And I think that's a very creative process in itself. Yeah. It's like in, in doing that, yeah. you know, we're, we're discovering ways of practising. And, and I think, you know, in many ways, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I, I think in many ways, Pure Land offers something which I think a lot of people have an intuition for, because it's a, it's a relational form of spirituality. Yeah. It's a form of spirituality in which we we work from the heart. We we feel that sort of heart calling out towards Buddha. We have this sense of the omnipresent goodness of, of Buddha and our, our relationship with it. And I, I think this is very much the sort of generic sense of spirituality that a lot of people have. And we express it through a very simple practice, which is our chanting practice. But we also have meditational practices, which are about discovering our nature, which are about um, experiencing gratitude, about offering, and, and so on. And, and I think all of these are, are practices which most people can actually relate to when they, they mm. start to do them. Sometimes the sort of form, if it can be strange, you know, if one's chanting and so on, people sort of say, well, what does Namo Amida Bu mean? But when you start to talk about it, you know, it, all it is is really, I call on the measureless. Mm. 